Let's get into our first presentation, which is Achieving a Quality Paint Finish with Rob Mountford from Resine Paints. Uh, the presentation will cover the correct specification um, of underlying plasterboard and level application of wallboard sealers um, in a focus on achieving quality uh, paint finish. Today's presenter, Rob Mountford, is the Technical Sales Support Manager for Resine, and he is responsible for training and supporting trade and specifier team reps. Rob also maintains specification services documentation, um, webinar development and delivery, uh, technical advice, uh, and general support or anything that's thrown his way from uh, the team at head office down in Wellington. Rob, lovely to have you with us this afternoon. Welcome. Hello, Matt. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Great to see a little bit of Dr. Zeus behind you on the wall. <laughs> yeah, thanks. That's fooling nobody, that one. Yeah. So, uh, great, great to see that bit of, bit of colour for, for today. Um, and Rob, looking forward to your presentation uh, and over to you. Cool. Thank you. Uh, we'll get straight into it. Um, now, the sections we're covering off today were part of a webinar I delivered a few months ago. However, the info um, that, that, um, that we're covering today relates to regular issues that we do see um, occurring regularly. So I thought it would be a great idea just to recap on those things uh, today as they really are critical steps when we're trying to achieve a quality paint finish. Now, if we don't get these ones right. Uh, we're not going to get a particularly good final outcome at the end of the day. So we'll just kick straight into it. Um, we're going to have a high level look at uh, plasterboard and levels of finish and warboard sealers. Um, these really are the two things that are going to translate to that, that final outcome being a, a really good result and um, us all meeting our clients' expectations at the end of the day. So. So the purpose of it is all to uh, understanding that to achieve a quality paint finish and minimise your issues, you've got to really start with the right plasterboard level. Um, and also that warboard sealer applications uh, is the easiest way to guide, uh, sorry, to gauge what the end result will be before it happens. So this is the, really a trick of the trade. Um, if you're out on sites and you're looking at, um, at uh, wallboard sealers going on. This is this is a window into the, the level of or quality of workmanship that's going on on your site. And if you see poor wallboard uh, sealer application, uh, you're likely going to get poor top coat application as well. So this is the point where we want to stop them and fix it before we get top coats on. Uh, but we'll cover it off as we go. Uh, so we'll. we'll uh, jump straight into plasterboard levels of finish. Now, good friends at uh, Winstone Warboards allow us to use their JIB uh, site guide information, which is it's a really comprehensive um, uh, and complete source of information. Um, it's freely downloadable on their website, so please do go and grab it if you need it. And um, you can take the whole lot or you can take different sections as you go. Um, important to understand that today's information really is just a general guide and it's really around paint issues. So there's a whole lot more information um, that relates to, um, to the, the quality of levels of finish. You could also jump into the Association of Wall and Ceiling Industries Trade Guidelines as well. Really good source of information there. So there's lots of, lots of good free information. So just as, a, as an intro um, and from the guide, um, having a clear understanding of the levels of finish is an important step in delivering an accepted or acceptable finished surface. And the levels of finish as set out in the guidelines and the ASNZS standards are specifying the required quality of finish prior to the application of decorative finishes such as paint. So that's a really important thing to note. Uh, we often get people um, asking us for a level five paint finish. Uh, paint is the decorative part of the uh, of the job, and it's all it's all about the actual um, fixing and stopping of your plasterboard um, that's going to determine your level of finish, and actually what you've specified in the initial phase. So again, just as I mentioned, level of finish relates to the plasterboard finish prior to the painting. And it's not a basis for establishing the acceptance or rejection criteria for the final decorated surface. So it's not acceptable for us, acceptable for us to all stand there at the end of a job and say, it's painted and that's not level five. 
we should have already um, made that uh, made that determination earlier before the paint goes on the wall. Often, uh, often builders and, and painters will put the sealers on the wallboards first and then have a look at the um, level of finish because it highlights what's going on on those wallboards, but it really needs to be done before your top coats go on. So again, just as a, just covering off the levels, I think we're probably all across these, but just to remind everyone, level three um, is areas that don't require decoration and they're in above ceiling levels or in service shafts and the like. Level four is the default uh, level of finish for all plasterboard linings, walls and ceilings. And then level five, and this is what we're gonna talk about a little bit more as I go, um, is the is the area that doesn't get specified enough, and it's where you're using gloss and semi-gloss paints, or where there's critical lighting conditions that are occurring on flat and low sheen paints. So flat paint usually on ceilings, low sheen paints usually our wallboards. Um, so where you've got critical light conditions, you should be specifying a level five finish, and also where dark colours are specified as well. So in both non-critical and critical lighting conditions. Now we have. Uh, you know, where we're specifying dark colours, um, we, what it does is it accentuates the imperfections on the walls. So it's really important when you're choosing your colours at, at um, specifying stage to think about that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat that as we go through as well, because it's, it's critical that you understand where critical light conditions are and where your dark colours are going to be. So in the guide, there's a really good um, there's a really good chart that shows it really quickly. There's a lot of arrows there that point towards level five. Uh, we're just going to focus on paint down the bottom there. I've just highlighted that flat matte low sheen paint. So again, that matte or flat paints are on your ceilings. Low sheens are typically on your walls. When you get into pastel mild tones, so that's your light colours, your whites and off whites. If you've got critical lighting areas, bang, it goes straight to level five. Um, if you've got dark tones, runs through critical or non-critical lighting like I was talking about and straight to level five as well. And then where you've got semi-gloss and gloss paints. Now, we don't see a lot of these on walls. We still use them a bit in bathrooms. One of the areas that catches people out in the industry is in aged care facilities. And we see a lot of this, particularly with long hallways. Uh, and we're using um, or specifying semi-gloss paint finishes on the walls there for, for good durability and cleanability. There's always a big door or window at the end of a hallway, and where those hallways are level four, um, you see a lot of imperfections along the walls. We get called in because people think there's a paint problem on the walls. It's not a paint problem at all. It's actually just that a level four um, has been specified and not a level five uh, finish along those walls to minimize the imperfections for the stopping uh, jointed areas. So what is critical light? I think we've probably all got a, a good idea of this, but we'll just cover it off. It's really simply that where light comes in at a shallow angle and where it hits the, uh, say, plaster compounds or imperfections, it casts a shadow down the wall. When light's coming in at right angles, it bounces off and you don't get that shadowing. So it, it exaggerates those imperfections in the walls changes as day as the day goes through as the light travels around your house um, and so things that aren't always uh, obvious at one point of the day can be extremely obvious um, at another point this is a good example of critical light this is a pretty brutal example of it to be fair um, a lot of light coming in there along the ceiling we always see these things not quite like that but um, where in our modern builds, we've got open plan, kitchen, living, uh, family areas, big expansive uh, sliding doors or um, bifolds, a lot of light coming in. If you haven't specified a level five finish on that ceiling, then you're gonna see imperfections. Um, this one's got a lot of other issues going on, I think, but it's a good example of how, how um, imperfections can, can be shown with critical light. This is a common one as well. So joint peaking, um, it's, it's pretty simple as the day goes through. There's a big window to the right there and it's showing the, the actual um, deviation there in the, in the wall boards. Now this is, this is the puppy that, um, that, that gets a lot of people. I think we've all got this kind of issue at home. I've certainly got this in my lounge area where my ceilings look perfect. 
and as the light changes through the day, or actually this, this one is from in my house is where uh, we turn on the light. So artificial lights will do this as well. Um, when I'm sitting down watching TV and the lights come on and I look up and um, I can see an imperfection on my ceiling. And it's, um, it's one of those things that um, no one else would see it, but we see it because we're living in the houses. Um, so your clients will see these as well when they're, when they're, when they're in their, um, and then that normal daily um, daily functions um, as they're turning on and off lights. That's the same wall there, uh, just left has got artificial light on it, right uh, it doesn't, so. This is, this is one that catches people out as well. Um, this is a really common issue, is that this, the paper face nature of the plaster board has a, has a rougher texture than the plaster, which is smooth. So, um, I've put this in, I couldn't find a, a, a photo, actually as I've, I've kind of come to think about it, this is a better example anyway of what's going on because you see it clearly. Um, the plaster is smooth, the paper is rough. Um, it's really common to see down, um, say, uh, critical light areas where it's a level four and it should have been a level five. You will see that different texture, you will see the joints because it's smoother than the paper. Uh, it's really difficult to completely cover that with paint. Um, if we're applying our paint at the right film builds, which I'm going to talk about as well, um, you've got more of a chance of disguising that. But if the paint's been put on pretty thin, um, you'll see these joints down the wall. So levels of finish. Uh, it's, it's important to understand the differences in, in framing and installation requirements as well needed to achieve a level five. A skim coat alone does not take a level four to a level five finish. There's some subtle differences. Um, again, in the, in the guide, uh, it states quite clearly there, if you'll see on the right hand side, that there's, there's a lesser tolerances for, um, for framing and, uh, and uh, straight edge uh, deviation uh, on those boards. So um, from level four to level five, there's just there's subtle differences when you're trying to achieve a level five. And then down the bottom there on the right, you'll see that um, all joints must be back blocked as well. So that's different to level four again. And of course, on the next page in the guide, it states quite clearly that a skim coat must be applied to remove uh, differential surface porosity. So that's what I was talking about with uh, that level four shot that actually, I'll just jump back to that there. So if we skimmed across that, um, we're, we're evening out that surface porosity. And there's a good example, level four versus level five. Um, Pretty, pretty simple thing. Level five is what we want to see. When there's a skim across, sometimes you can see um, the jointing coming through, but, but you're pretty much evening out that surface uh, porosity. Now, just a quick note on, on uh, paint manufacturers' surface preparation products. We've, um, we've all got them. In our range, it's Broadwell 3 and one um, The other manufacturers will have them as well. They're really good for... Um, for improving the surface uh, conditions and equalizing that porosity across the boards and the stopping compounds. Um, a lot of them, uh, particularly this one, Broadwell uh, 3 and one is their surfaces, sealers, and sealing paints as well often. So they're really good for productivity in group housing, large commercial projects, apartments, all sorts of things. But it's, it's really important to note as well that they do not improve a level four to a level five finish if you haven't done the, the things that we've just shown you there with uh, in terms of the construction, the fixing and stopping, the framing before that. So the best way to consider these things, um, and just, just as before I go on as well, there's a, there's a debate that goes on regularly about whether this is considered a skim coat or not. Um, we have people in the industry that would say that, um, that they're not considered a skim coat. Um, and others that do, so I'll stay out of that one. But what, what I would say is I, the, the best way that I uh, describe uh, these types of surfacing products is that they'll take a level four to a level four and a half finish. So they're, they're going to improve that surface um, condition for you, but they won't take a level four to a level five. The other thing to note as well is you need a skilled applicator to, to uh, apply them. Uh, so assessing the final surface uh, should be undertaken under normal lighting conditions as well and normal viewing angles. So again, this is from the guide. 
we always see people with spotlights. They uh, that's that's not for us to use. That's not for for clients to use. That's um, our jib plasterers and stoppers use those kind of things when they're doing the work so that it can see the imperfections. There's a really good guide as to um, where you should be standing to view at normal lighting conditions of the of the environment and the distances that you would be viewing things to assess whether it's acceptable or not. This is another uh, thing that I've, I've uh, covered as well. This is catches people out all the time, particularly at this time of year, is the time it takes for plaster compounds to dry through completely. And if you just have a quick look there, um, just circle that. If you're at 10 degrees, which we're below in a lot of the areas in New Zealand at the moment, and you're above, say, 90, 90 94% relative humidity, take you six to 10 days for your plaster compounds to dry properly before they should be painted. Often we're uh, pushing through on programs and painters get in and painting them after a day or two, you end up with all sorts of issues, pumping more moisture into the plaster compounds and it, I've seen it where it just comes off the wall and sheets. So how do we disguise surface imperfections? Um, we use matte or low sheen paint products, so matte on ceilings, low sheen on uh, walls that deflects less uh, light, it scatters the light as it comes, and we use a roller to impart an orange peel effect and it diffuses the light. And lighter colours simply disguise imperfections more than darker colours do. So we'll just flick through this. And again, the way it accentuating surface, surface imperfections is literally the opposite of that, using semi gloss or gloss paints. Smooth surfaces uh, by spray application will accentuate your, your issues and darker colors. Uh, and I've just chucked in some nice red boxes there, so I forgot I'd done that. Um, so when we're spraying application, when we're using spraying application, all industry guidelines say that we should back roll that, that wet paint with a roller. Um, what it does is it imparts that orange peel effect and diffuses the light. Where you have a smooth surface, uh, it's deflecting the light and you're seeing those imperfections. And back rolling, we don't see enough of this. People think that a smooth spray finish is fantastic, um, but actually all industry guidelines state you should back roll your paint to impart that orange peel effect. Uh, another note on spraying is if you have an issue during construction or painting, really difficult to touch up a surface that's been sprayed whereas with, with rolling you can touch that up pretty quickly. So the main issues that we see that aren't paint problems, level four finishes and critical light environments like we've talked about uh, and we see those textural differences with paper versus plaster. Um, dark colors and level four you're going to see issues so and then smooth finishes as well. So key points on that, uh, level of finish needs to be considered at design stage, really be aware of your critical light environments or areas in your house. Every residential dwelling, commercial dwelling has them. Um, your colour choice, really think about your colour choice as well um, with your level of finish requirements. And we really need to be working in conjunction with our builders and painters so that we're all achieving that really good um, outcome for our customers. And Important to note, again, just repeating, the paint finish is not going to improve a level four to a level five. Now we're going to touch on warboard sealers quickly, because um, these are the key in painting, particularly with whites and off-whites. Warboard sealers are intended to provide porosity equalization across the paper face, like I've talked about, and give the top coat something to hold on to. What we want is a uniform application of a quality warboard uh, sealer at the specified rates because it's critical to achieving good coverage on your top coats. Whenever anyone says they've got coverage issue on their top coats and they're talking about a white, I know for a fact that they haven't put enough paint on the wall. I'm going to show you, show you a few slides um, that gives you a good visual uh, indication of what to be looking out for. A solid white base coat of a warboard sealer is critical when, you, when you've got whites and off whites being chosen as top coats. This is a poor application of a warboard sealer. Um, this is sprayed on, uh, and if it was rolled, you'd see a fairly similar zigzaggy kind of texture. Quite simply, hasn't put enough paint on the wall. We see this all too often. It's really common, unfortunately. It's really uneven. There's surface texture all over the place, and our top coats are just left with a poor surface 
to go over the top. And often this broadcasts through your top coats. And we all stand there on site, Mr. Painter is scratching his head because the top coats don't look flash. Well, it's this stuff that's broadcasting through um, and, and giving it that real poor result at the end of the day. That's a uniform application of a wallboard sealer. That's really easy to do. Just put enough paint on the wall or put it on at the specified rates and you can paint your walls white with a wallboard sealer. Sometimes you see a few things grinning through, but generally you should be able to paint your walls white. It evens out the texture and porosity and it gives us that solid base coat that's just going to provide us with the best platform to put our white top coats over the top. Now, I'm yet to be um, have anyone try and argue with me that starting with a solid white base coat is going to create is, is going to have issues when they put their white top coats on. It's it's just a no-brainer. How can you have a problem putting two white top coats over that and then um, and come back to us to say there's coverage issues? It's impossible. That's what a poor quality or low quality wallboard sealer looks like under a microscope. That's not a resin product, by the way. Um, uh, what they, they're, they're high in extender pigments and they just leave a uh, really porous and really textured surface and it just increases the roughness of the surface, creates patchiness and it um, limits the chances of achieving really good um, uh, coverage or opacity over the top of it. That's another one, different brand, different manufacturer. Um, and typically the issue that you have here, and this is something that people don't think about enough, is because that's so textured when it goes on the wall, um, they've got to sand it smooth. So what they end up doing is sand that product off the wall. So they're removing all the paint that they just put on there. So again, we're kind of buggered before we start on getting good coverage with our top coats. That's a good quality wallboard sealer, and that is a resin product. That's just decorate a high cover. That, that's a trade line product. And you can see the visual difference in that. They do have far better lay down flow properties and they literally do not require a lot of sanding to, and they achieve really good opacity. And that's a really good base coat for your top coats to go over the top. Really important that they're putting them on with the right roller sleeves as well. Number one sleeve is an eight mil Dacron sleeve. All too often we see guys using the long roller sleeves as paint manufacturers, and I talk about, um, I think I can speak on behalf of our friends at the other manufacturers as well, as we test our products with the correct tools and recommend the correct tools to put them on. When, when people go out and decide that they're gonna buy bulk packs of other things uh, or other, other incorrect roller sleeves, then they have problems. They simply don't put enough paint on the wall when they're using five mil microfiber sleeves. So the common issues we see, low quality wallboard sealers are used. And let's be honest, I'll cut straight to it here as well. There's a reason they're used, it's because they're cheap. Um, there's nothing, there's really nothing else that you can um, kind of uh, pin it to. Um, we see them not from the same supplier. If you're using resin top coats, use resin primers. The industry or the building code dictates that. Um, if, you, if you mix and match, you're not, you're, not, you're not supported by anyone. We see incorrect roller sleeves used. And we see paint being overspread and uneven application and sealers being sanded through. So it just gives us a substandard starting point for our top coats to achieve good opacity and coverage. And a poor finish of a top coat is often misunderstood as stemming uh, from, or not, not understood as stemming from a wallboard sealer choice and application methods. So just as a reminder, on the left, you don't wanna see that. If you see that on site, stop everyone in their tracks give us a call, or actually you should deal directly with the painter. The course of action is talk to the painter directly. If they ask us to come to site, we'll come to site and put them right. Pretty simple though. What you wanna see is the thing on the right hand side. And that's the most important thing for achieving a quality outcome at the end of the day with whites and off whites. Warboard sealer, absolutely critical. And it's the first full coat in a three coat paint system. That's really misunderstood out there. Um, always specify and enforce paint products from the same supplier. And as I've, I'm repeating myself here again, but uniform application of a quality wallboard sealer at a specified rate is critical. Um, it's a window, as I said at the beginning, into the workmanship that's being carried out on site. If you see poor quality wallboard sealer going on, I guarantee you you're gonna have poor quality application of your top coats. And that's me, that was a pretty race through kind of um, uh, uh, 
spiel there for you. But if you do have any queries, feel free to uh, contact me directly and I'll point you, I'll either answer your queries or point you in the right direction. Hey Rob, thanks for that. A couple of quick questions for you. How do you deal with uh, obvious plastering stopping areas once the job's been finished? Uh, yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a, a, a difficult thing sometimes to deal with. Um, they literally, we can go one of two ways. We can either try and put uh, a flatter coating over. So sometimes we'll go from a low sheen warboard uh, coating down to a flat coating to really try and disguise it. The lower the sheen, the more disguising effect it has. But often we actually have to get into those areas being re-skimmed by a plasterer. So it, it's actually a bit of a big deal to to, um, to get the remedial work done in those areas. Hence why I want to be proactive and try and avoid it. Proactive, get it at the yes. beginning and catch them before they start, yeah. Okay, uh, another one. Who's responsible at the end of a job if there are defects in the stopping? Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's an interesting one as well. And as I, as I kind of touched on, is once a painter has put paint on the wall, he's actually accepted that the surface is, in the, is the level that's at, uh, required for him to proceed with his painting. So the course of action is actually back through the painter because he's accepted that quality of plastering at that point. So that's an education thing for us in the industry as well to, to let them know if they're not happy, don't proceed because at that point they're owning it if they put their top coats on or even this. Yep. There is that yep. little area like I talked about that they'll work with the plasterers and builders by putting a sealer on the wall just to see those last little bits of imperfections as well. Yes, okay. And uh, if a painter has a preferred wallboard sealer uh, that they use that isn't a resine product, um, you know, comments or guidance there? Yep, um, like, I, like I touched on near the end there is that um, it's really important to stay with the same paint manufacturers products. It's dictated by the by the building code and in the systems must be the same. So you don't want to see different products being used on site. It should be one, one supplier's product being used. Great. Hey well Rob, let's just leave that there for now uh, and we'll um, we'll get into our second presentation and bring you back on uh, towards the end. So Rob appreciate your presentation there. Um, I'll